Good afternoon. My name is Eric Smith with Gregory Industries in Canton, Ohio. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Today we have with us John Durkos from Road Systems Incorporated, headquartered in Big Spring, Texas, but working from offices in Cleveland, Ohio. John has been Vice President Technical Support for Road Systems for 21 years and has 37 years experience in providing technical support and product promotion in the highway and roadside safety industry, specifically with barriers and terminals and crash cushions. Mr. Durkos has served on several NCHRP panels and has been an active member of ATSA, TRB Com Committee AFB20, the Committee on Roadside Safety Design, and Task Force 13 for 30 years. Please welcome John Durkos. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is John Durkos. I am located in Ohio. The number you see on the screen right now is contact information. So if after this presentation you would like to reach me, uh, you are welcome to call me at that number. Today we're going to be discussing the MASH terminal called the MSKT. It is a test level three terminal and it is used uh, all throughout the country. Uh, it has just now been added to the Texas standards and that's what we're gonna focus on. To start things off, I'd like to kind of set some ground rules for the presentation and, and this is really applicable for anybody that's involved in this product, whether it's during the installation, the inspection, or the maintenance. I can't stress enough, it's critically important that you follow the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, number two, do not mix different parts of products with each other. Now, there are some of our products that do have interchangeability, but not all of those pro uh, products' components are interchangeable. So, uh, generally, do not mix the different products' parts. Uh, and then number three, know the differences between the parts. Taking a look back at what Texas has done historically, there have been five terminals that have been used. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I thought a good place to start would be to state the differences between them. So when you see these products out on the side of the road that you are able to quickly identify which product is which. So I'm gonna start off uh, talking about the SKT uh, and then some additional products that have been used through the years. The SKT, is a system that is available in either a 28 inch rail height or a 31 inch rail height. In a wood post system, it is identified as a type one, a type two, or a type three. The type one has two foundation tubes, the type two has four foundation tubes, and with the type three, there are eight steel foundation tubes. Another version of the SKT is a steel post system that has all eight posts that are hinged. There's an upper and a lower bolted connection, and that system was only available at a 28 inch rail height. Our current steel post version, we call the SP or the standard post system. That system was originally approved by TxDOT at a 31 inch rail height, and then it was later added at a 28 inch rail height for uh, primarily for maintenance uh, when there were still some 28 inch high terminals that were being installed. You've heard me mention the difference between the rail heights. There's uh, another difference uh, besides the height of the rail. When it's a 28 inch system, and I'm gonna refer to that one as the old standard. Uh, the rail height at 28 inches, but uh, one of the key characteristics of that system is all the guardrail splices occurred at the post. Uh, typically, you would have all rail lengths at 25 feet long. So the end panel would be 25 feet. There would be a second 25 foot panel and that those two 25 foot rails would make up the system. With a newer 31 inch system, the rail height is 31 inches, the end panel uh, spans from post one to post three. It does splice at the third post, but all other rail splices occur mid-span between posts. So the end rail would be 12 and a half feet. The next rail is an odd length at nine foot four and a half. And what that does is that establishes the point where you begin the mid-span splicing uh, within the terminal. And then after that, a 25 foot rail section is used. Looking at the SKT head, uh, it is unique in that it is the longest of all the impact heads. You can see here that the feeder chute uh, actually uh, hovers over the anchor bracket. So when you see a long feeder chute like that, it is the SKT. 
It's also open if you're looking at it from the side. Uh, there is a center stiffener plate that you see here, and then there's a deflector plate. Uh, the feeder chute, looking at it from the top, tapers. It gets wider as it travels downstream. The front impact face is square. There is a cable anchor bracket that attaches to special shoulder bolts that has an unthreaded shank portion of that bolt, and the anchor bracket has hooks on it that uh, engages within the shoulder of the bolt, allowing the bracket to uh, stay tight during uh, impact, but during an end-on impact, it can uh, release. The uh, rail goes in through the throat area, and that throat area is open, so we're not flattening out the corrugations. There's still corrugations in the rail when it comes out of the impact head. And another characteristic of that end rail is that it has these half by four inch slots that you see here. There's uh, three that would be in the valley of the rail here, and then there's uh, an option to have five in the top corrugation and five in the bottom corrugation. Those additional 10 slots are not needed, but for a universal rail, we do uh, offer that uh, with a total of 13 slots, but a, as a minimum, it would have to have these three slots in the valley. As you can see, the SKT uh, rail is kinked, sequentially kinked. SKT stands for sequential kinking terminal. You can see the corrugations are still in the rail, but th there's a series of sequential kinks that allows that impact head to travel downstream, absorbing the impact of the energy. Uh, another product that has been used widely in Texas is the ET Plus, and that is a product uh, from Trinity Industries. The unique characteristic of that is that it has a rectangular impact face. It's not square. The feeder chute is much shorter. It doesn't come nearly to the cable anchor bracket. The cable anchor bracket is very different. It, it has uh, six tabs that interlock with the rail. So if you see a rail that does not have those slots and has those six uh, cutouts, for that anchor bracket, that is an, uh, a rail that would be used with the ET plus. And the throat uh, air, uh, area does narrow because the rail uh, with this system is flattened, it's not kinked. And the width of that feeder chute, you'll find two models, either four or five inches wide. So here you see what a, uh, an ET uh, damaged rail looks like. So you can see the impact head travel down the rail and it flattened out the rail. There's no kinks but it has been flattened or extruded. There was an older version of the ET Plus called the ET2000. It used the same end rail, the same cable anchor bracket, but the impact head was much heavier. It was about 100 pounds heavier and it had a square front. Uh, that impact head can be found with or without these rubber bumpers that you see here. Another product that uh, TechStata adopted uh, about four years ago or so, a uh, product called the X-Lite, and that is from uh, Lindsay Transportation. That has a rectangular impact head. Uh, the ground strut is unique. It uh, actually looks like a couple of pieces of round bar. There is a slider bracket that is uh, unique to that system. And there are these special shear bolts that you see here that are used at the splice at post five and seven. Uh, all the rails in this system must be uh, 12 and a half feet. And unlike the previous systems that we talked about, the SKT and the ETs, uh, those were available in steel or wood. The x Light was only available in steel. The current MASH product offered by Trinity is called the Soft Stop. It does not have a timber post option. It has a very narrow face. Uh, the unique characteristic of that is the way that the rail is uh, uh, cut and uh, bolted together to form an anchor paddle that you see here. Uh, the anchor rail uh, has the big cutout where the sections of the rail are brought together and then anchored at uh, the anchor post. Uh, it's actually in front of post number one. So this would be called post zero as opposed to post one. So those are the systems that were predominantly used over the past oh, 15, probably getting on 20 years. But prior to that, there was a product that was called the Best. And uh, that system kind of looked like an SKT from the front in that it had a square head, but it was very different in the way that it functioned. And if you look closely, it had this uh, lip that was formed on the top. That's a unique characteristic of it. 
and it had a very different type of a post breaker. But the key there is inside, rather than flattening or kinking the rail, it had these cutter teeth that would uh, split the rail or slice it. So my, my whole purpose there to take the first uh, five minutes or so was to be sure that you understand that there's a lot of different products that you're going to see around the state. They are unique in their components and do not intermix the components one with the other. When that happens, uh, we sometimes call those Frankenstein terminals. Uh, an example of a Frankenstein terminal would be what you see here. This is uh, our SKT head but we uh, see the rail does not have the slots. This is an ET rail with an ET bracket, but an SKT head. You can't expect the terminal to perform as intended when you mix parts. Uh, this one is just the opposite. This is an ET head, but it has an SKT rail and an SKT bracket. Again, you can't expect the system to perform as designed when you interchange parts like that. So take a look at this one. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, what rail is it? Well, it looks like the SKT rail. I see the slots on the top and the bottom. Uh, I see the anchor bracket, but as far as an impact head, not even an impact head. So you can see that if it can be done out in the field, it will be done. And these are the things that we very uh, strongly discourage and we need to uh, guard against. So let's jump into the MSKT. It's the MASH SKT system and it's intended for attachment to standard 31 inch metal beam guard fence as used in Texas. Uh, Texas does have a standard sheet that was released a few months ago. Uh, it is uh, SGT uh, 12S 31-18. 31 is my rail height, dash 18 is the year that it was released. And this is uh, the standard sheet for the MSKT. Now, there's not a standard sheet yet, but uh, it is also available in a wood post version. Uh, however, the first two posts, everything up at the front, is identical, whether it be a wood post system or a steel post system. Uh, the difference with the wood post system is post three through eight, rather than being a six-foot steel guardrail post with a block, it's a six-foot timber CRT post with a block. I want to mention that uh, this webinar will be recorded and I uh, hope that uh, those that have not seen it will uh, log on to, to, to watch it. But uh, we also have on our website, on the Road Systems website, there is a training program that uh, you can take for yourself at any given time. So you would go to the website uh, that you see here. Uh, it is accessible from the Road Systems website. That would be roadsystems.com. And this system uh, offers a training course made up of six lessons. Uh, I, I'm going to focus primarily on lessons five and six. Lesson five is the segment of the course where you install it. And then lesson six allows you to take a test. And uh, if you successfully complete the test, you can print a certificate. Uh, I want to touch on just a couple of the features of this uh, training program. You can view the completed system in 3D. As you see here, you can explode all the parts or bring the parts back together uh, within the program. You can uh, rotate the entire system and view it from any perspective. And as I said, in Chapter 5, Session 5, there is a Build It section. So you start off with the ground that would have uh, post three and beyond already installed. And what you're gonna start with is installing post one and two from the ground up. So you go to a directory of parts that would be down below. And what you would do is you would grab lower post number two and click it and then click it where it goes into the, the uh, opening uh, for lower post number two. Uh, moving through that installation a little bit, you can see uh, upper and lower post number one and two have uh, been installed within the uh, directory of parts down below. Once the part is accounted for, you'll see a little check mark here. So upper and lower posts one and two have now been installed. Uh, moving through the installation a little bit further, uh, you can see that the uh, W-beam rail, the end rail section has been installed and the ground strut has been installed. Uh, continuing through the installation a little bit more. Uh, everything is complete with the exception of these two parts in the 
uh, directory that have no check mark. That would be the two bolts. So at the base of post number one, there would be a 5 8 bolt that would go right here. At the base of post number two, there would be a three quarter bolt that would go right here. And then once you click those two bolts and put them in place, you now have a completed system. The directory of parts will change and you'll see that little green check mark down below to say you have now completed the installation. And then once you do that, you would move on to lesson six. That would allow you to take the test and if you choose to, print out a certificate. And here you see the page uh, where you take the final exam. I would strongly encourage anybody that wants further training or to get a certificate. Uh, this is at your uh, fingertips at any given time. So uh, looking at the two systems, the current MASH MSKT and the previous NCHRP report 350 SKT, at a glance, they look very similar. You do have some of the parts that are interchangeable. Probably the easiest way to tell the difference <clears throat> is the impact uh, head has a closed feeder chute for the mash head. Now, I do want to mention that that mash head can be used on and has been used on NCHRP 350 SKTs. So just because you may see an MSKT head that may or may not be a MASH system. There are other parts that you need to look for to distinguish that it is in fact a MASH system and not simply an NCHRP 350 system with the MASH head. Uh, as I said, there are some parts that are interchangeable. All the uh, rail sections are the same. Uh, the cable anchor system, the cable, the anchor bracket, the shoulder bolts, uh, those are all the same whether it be the 350 system or the new MASH MSKT. <clears throat> Here you see the MSKT head, the MASH head. It has the letters SKT uh, cut out. And uh, the weight and the length are about the same as the 350 version, so you won't see a whole lot of difference as far as the installation or handling it. Here you see the MSKT in place. Uh, before any system can be expected to perform as designed, you need to be sure that you install it uh, in an area where you do have good grading. You know, when these terminals are crash tested, they're tested at an area where the ground is flat and level and the vehicle remains stable prior to the impact. So you need to be sure that you have advanced grading, adjacent grading, and runout grading as you see here. So at a first glance, this is a, a pretty nice looking picture. Everything looks uh, pretty well uh, uh, manicured, uh, but note that there's a slope. And if you were to visualize yourself about to hit the end of that terminal, you would have your two driver's side uh, tires up on the uh, grating there. And then your other two tires would be down in the grass. And there's a good chance that your vehicle would be very unstable and possibly to the point of rolling over. So uh, you can't expect the terminal to uh, address that instability in the vehicle. So we need to be sure that we have good grading around any terminal that's installed. Uh, another characteristic of this system is that it needs to be installed with the entire length of the rail straight. Uh, no bent radius curved rail is permitted within the terminal itself. Now the terminal can attach to curved rail, but there's no curved guardrail permitted within the terminal. Looking at the components of the system, the uh, rail height is at 31 inches and it is intended to attach to downstream guardrail that is also at 31 inches with the mid-span splices. Now if you do have a location of 28 inch guardrails and you want to put a MASH 31 inch terminal uh, you'll need to consult your uh, field engineer, your area engineer, possibly your, uh, your, your, your home office there. Uh, they will direct you on how to address that. But again, this is a 31-inch high terminal intended for attachment to 31-inch guardrails. The installation manual that you see here, this is available on the website. And again, that website is www.roadsystems.com. There's a left shoulder installation 
31 inch rail height you can see there's a splice here at post number three this is a nine foot four and a half inch rail to establish a mid-span splice between post number four and post number five we do have an installation tolerance of plus or minus an inch on the finished uh, guardrail height so the rails in the system the first rail is unique it has those half by four slots that we talked about it has holes for the attachment of the cable anchor bracket it is 12 and a half feet long and splices at the third post your second rail is nine foot four and a half inches and then everything after that is standard guard rail most times in Texas you'll probably see the third rail and all the rails remaining being 25 foot rails however 12 and a half foot rails are acceptable looking at the components of the system starting at the top left and we'll go clockwise here the MSKT impact head itself is bolted to post number one the rail is not bolted to post number one but the impact head is you can see your uh, special end rail with those half by four slots the shoulder bolts attach the cable anchor bracket when this system is hit the impact head will travel downstream your splice bolts your post bolts and those shoulder bolts that attach the bracket can all easily pass through that impact head but the anchor bracket cannot so we need to be sure that we have the correct anchor bracket the correct shoulder bolts and that there is a way for that anchor bracket to become uh, dislodged as that impact head travels downstream you can see at the second post there is an open-ended slot actually there's a couple of them here uh, those open-ended slots need to be facing toward post number one so on an end on hit that feeder chute will hit post number two there is a hinge bolt a three-quarter inch hinge bolt at the downstream side of post number two and that post then will pivot lay down and uh, many times you'll see that that second post uh, can be reused there's a ground strut that spans between posts one and two the ground strut is not symmetrical you can see here at post number two that ground strut has to span uh, almost the whole uh, width of the post in order to be able to capture the shoulder bolt or the uh, uh, hinge bolt and then at the base of post number one that uh, ground strut only uh, travels just a short distance to be able to attach to post number one so that these uh, forks on the ground strut are going to be shorter at post number one than they are post number two uh, as I said at post number two we have a three-quarter hinge bolt on the downstream side at post number one we have a five-eighths uh, connection bolt attaching upper and lower post one and that is on the upstream side the bolt that you see here on the downstream side of post one is also five-eighths but that is attached uh, the uh, ground strut to lower post number one the bearing plate is eight inches square but the hole is not in the middle when the bearing plate is properly oriented it will have a five inch dimension up and a three inch dimension down and because it is uh, top heavy there's a potential for that bearing plate to rotate should the cable become loose so we use this retainer tie uh, to try to uh, keep the bearing plate properly oriented with the five inch dimension up and the three inch dimension down so these are the major components of the MSKT the unique parts or sometimes we call them the smart parts that are all in the area of post number one and post number two uh, post number one is uh, unique in that it has a, a spacer an angle spacer here now there was an NCHRP 350 version of the SKT the system that we call the SKT SP that also had an upper post that was a tube post number two is a six inch I beam post number one upper is a six by six square tube we did use that on the NCHRP 350 version uh, of the SKT SP but on the MASH version we added this 
uh, spacer angle here that the bearing plate rests up against. So the bearing plate's actually being reoriented a little bit because of this spacer angle. The other thing that we have as part of all of the impact heads that, that we produce, and this was uh, the systems back in the NCHRP 350 days as well, it has a product identification plate. This is uh, information that we use internally here that helps us to track which one of our plants that we produce the head, uh, lot numbers, and, and, and such. So uh, that does help us to uh, be able to I know a little bit about that impact head, uh, should there be a need to uh, trace back some older records. <clears throat> so looking at the uh, complete system in place, upper and lower post number one. Uh, upper one, again, is a six by six square tube. Lower post number one is a heavier I-beam. It's a six inch I-beam, but it's a little bit heavier than the others. Uh, upper and lower post number two that are bolted. Uh, lower post number two goes six feet into the ground, and then uh, post three through eight are standard six foot long guardrail posts. So if the post is six foot long, you would only have a uh, portion of it that would, uh, that would that would be in the ground, not the entire six foot. And uh, you can see here that all of the posts are spaced at six foot three. Beginning length of need, B-L-O-N, post number three. If you're not familiar with the term, the beginning length of need uh, simply identifies the point within the system that it has the uh, ability to perform just like guardrail if it's hit on the traffic face. So we know that guardrail, when it's hit, is intended to capture, contain, and redirect the vehicle. Well, the terminal does have those same redirective capabilities if it's impacted at or downstream of the third post. So designers need to keep that BLON point, the beginning of length of need point, in mind uh, when they identify the hazard and uh, establish how much guardrail is needed for a typical installation. Looking closer at uh, post number one and two, you can see the ground strut. Uh, the bearing plate's not shown here for clarity. Uh, but you can see the uh, cable going through uh, upper and lower post number one. Uh, lower post number one has a soil plate that's shop welded. And when post number one is installed, that soil plate should be on the downstream side to resist rotation of the post on an end on impact. So this is what lower post number one looks like. It's a six inch long, uh, uh, six foot long. It's a W6 inch by 15 pound uh, post. Uh, 15 pound means it's 15 pounds per foot. So uh, 15 pounds times six feet long. Uh, that'll tell you how much the post weighs. And then of course you have to add the weight of the soil plate. And then these welded side plates and the cap plate up on top of the post. And we'll talk more about those uh, side plates and cap plates uh, as we move through the presentation. But uh, what you see there is lower post number one, six foot long. Now I do want to uh, emphasize that that six foot is uh, in intended to be embedded. Uh, we've seen instances of contractors cutting the post off because they hit rock or they have difficulty uh, driving the post. Uh, we do not permit that uh, unless there are other conditions that are satisfied. If you have solid rock, we do have um, allowances that you could drill into the rock and cut the post off, but only if you follow those instructions. But in general terms, our rule is do not cut off the post uh, unless you follow the instructions of, of how to address that. Upper post number one you see here, this is the six inch by six inch tube. It's only an eighth inch wall tube, so it's fairly light. It has a spacer angle that you see there, so uh, this part of the post would have the bearing plate resting up against it. The anchor cable would be coming through this hole that you see here. Looking at it from the side, uh, this is where the 5 8 bolt would connect upper and lower post one on the upstream side of the post. And then looking at it from the back side is where the anchor cable comes through. And then these holes are where the impact head attaches to upper post number one. Again, remember we said the impact head itself is attached to post number one. The rail is not. 
on the left you see upper post one, on the right you see lower post one. Uh, those are the side plates that I mentioned to you, and uh, upper post one rests right in this little area right here, setting on top of what we call the cap plate. And the, these uh, sets of holes here on the front would be for the ground strut, and then this would be to attach upper and lower post one. Uh, contractors, uh, attention, when you're driving post number one, or lower post number two, you do not pound on the side plates. You could potentially damage them or break the weld. So uh, you would need to uh, develop some type of a driving cap and, uh, or of course you could auger the hole and drop it in that way. But if any posts are augered as opposed to drilled or pounded rather, uh, we would uh, emphasize that you need to get good compaction uh, before you uh, call that system complete. What you see here is an example of what a driving cap might look like. We do not design these, we do not manufacture them. A contractor would need to uh, design one or develop one that would be compatible with the equipment that they have and the procedures that they want to use for driving the post. But with a system like this, all of your load would be a applied to the top portion and then this cap would interact with the cap plate of lower post one and ensure that we're not pounding on the side plates. I apologize for the noise there but uh, what you were seeing there, and I'll go back to it, what you were seeing there is how not to install. So the one view you were seeing, they were pounding on the side plates, which we cautioned not to do, and the uh, view on the right, they were uh, pounding post one with the upper and lower post already bolted together, and you don't want to do that. So again, I'll go back to that, but uh, we do not want to drive on the post, side plates and we do not want to drive with upper and lower already bolted. So here do not pound directly on the post side plates. And then here do not pound with the upper post and this is actually post number two with the posts already uh, bolted together. Uh, this is an example of what a driving cap might look like for post number two. And here you can see they are driving post number two with a cap. So your loads are not on the side plates, but on the I-beam portion of the post itself. Looking at the base of post number one, you see the ground strut attached to the side plates with this 5 8 bolt. You see upper and lower post one bolted on the upstream side with this 5 8 bolt. Your retainer tie, your bearing plate resting up against that spacer that puts kind of a negative angle on the bearing plate as opposed to the bearing plate resting up against uh, the post itself. At post number two, upper and lower bolted. Uh, those are those open-ended slots that I mentioned and that would attach the post bolt uh, and the rail uh, to the post with that open-ended slot. Again, that open-ended slot facing toward post number one. Looking at the ground strut, the shorter tabs at post number one because we don't have to travel as far with a bolt on the upstream side and then the uh, longer portion of the ground strut at post number two. There's post number two in place. You can see there's a three quarter by eight and a half bolt on the downstream side. A washer is not needed at this connection, but if there were to be washers installed, that's not a problem. But it was uh, designed and tested uh, without washers at post number two. Upper post number two, those open-ended slots that attaches the rail to the post, those slots are facing uh, toward post number one. 
The reason that there's two slots is this post was used with the older 28-inch rail height. So if this was a 28-inch rail height, you would be using the lower open-ended slot. But seeing that this is a 31-inch MSKT, we attach the rail to the post using the upper slot. I'd also like to note that the bolt that's used there is just a short splice bolt, inch and a quarter or possibly inch and a half. Uh, but we do not want to use a full length uh, post bolt that would be used with a wood block where the threads and the nut would be on the back side of the flange. Uh, that is not permissible. Here's a unit that was hit, uh, post number one, because the bolt is on the upstream side. When upper post number one is released, it tears away. So upper post number one cannot be reused. But on post number two, the bolt is on the downstream side. And uh, under many impact conditions, we may see that upper post number two uh, can be reused. You'd uh, stand it back up and uh, make sure everything's tightened up. Again, the impact head is attached to post number one, the rail is not. The connection of the impact head to post number one is a couple of little uh, 5 16 inch by one inch hex bolts. There's a washer on both sides of that connection. And there you can see our uh, product ID plate. Very important part of the design of uh, both the NCHRP350 SKT and the MASH system is the anchor bracket and the ability of the anchor bracket to release on an end-on hit. We do that by using this special high-strength shoulder bolt. <clears throat> the picture that you see here, this washer is actually a captive washer that is part of the bolt itself. Now, when the system was first uh, introduced, there were two loose washers, and uh, we felt if we could uh, attach that washer to the bolt itself, it would help to ensure a proper installation that there would always be a washer uh, on this side of the connection as well as the other side on the other side of the traffic face rail, as you see here. So that's the uh, special shoulder bolt that we use at eight places to uh, connect the anchor bracket to the end rail. Now this is uh, this is the SKT head. I, I know that uh, this may or may not be uh, an end rail, but the one thing that I can tell for sure is that this is not the proper anchor bracket. This uh, anchor bracket has no uh, openings, and there's no way for that bracket to release on an end-on hit. This one, the bolts were put in from the traffic side. Another one that was installed wrong is the bolts were put in from the backside. Again, this is not the correct anchor uh, bracket. There's no way for that bracket to release if it were to be hit head on. So what might happen? Well, this is a different system, but uh, something very similar would happen. There would be an attempt by the impact head to release the bracket from the rail, but it's bolted solid and it's not going to be able to release. So you're going to have uh, all of your energy being uh, brought to a halt right at that point and uh, that's, that's uh, a consequence of something bad that could likely happen. So be sure that we use the correct parts when assembling this product. <clears throat> what you see here is the uh, contractor is restricting the cable from twisting when you tighten the nut on the end of the cable. And uh, by doing that, uh, it prevents the cable from unwinding over time. If you were to just twist that cable, uh, it would uh, have a, a strong potential to become slack and uh, the, the cable would, would uh, become loose. So uh, do secure that anchor uh, 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 cable from uh, from twisting or rotating when you tighten the nut. Uh, the system should have uh, sheeting, reflective sheeting installed, and you be sure that you're putting it on a good, clean, dry surface, or you may end up with something looking like the picture on the left. Uh, inspection, 
within the installation manual, this happens to be page 20 in our installation manual, we do have an inspection checklist. And we would recommend that this checklist be used at the completion of an installation, uh, at the completion of a unit that's been refurbished, uh, or after a retrofit. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a retrofit here in just a minute. So some of the things that you want to check, uh, and these are some of the steps on our inspection checklist for a completed MSKT uh, going from top left uh, uh, clockwise. We uh, be sure that we have the proper rails, the short nine foot four rail, the uh, rest of the rail is a standard straight rail, no curves. Uh, post number two is uh, correct. All the posts are spaced at six foot three. We have uh, the end rail that is the correct uh, MSKT end rail. The impact head is uh, parallel to the top of the rail. We won't, don't want the uh, impact head sagging. Uh, there is no bolted connection of the rail to the post at post number one. However, all of the other uh, rails uh, do uh, bolt to the post. So it's only at post one where there's no rail to post connection. The stub height of lower post one and two, we try to keep that to be no more than four inches. Uh, be sure that we have the correct shoulder bolts and that uh, the post, uh, lower posts one and two are properly oriented. Uh, the uh, post bolt, uh, as I said, is connected uh, to the rail at two through eight, but there are no washers on the traffic side. We never use a washer at the post bolt connection and our rail height at 31 inches. I'm not going to talk too much about the crash testing, but I do want to mention that uh, the reason that we had to move to MASH terminals is because the vehicles change. And the reason the vehicles change is because the older vehicles that we used to test with are no longer being produced. So both the small car and the pickup truck have increased by 600 pounds. Those uh, 820, 1100, 2000, 2270, those are uh, metric um, uh, values for the weight, uh, 820 uh, kilograms. Uh, which is equal to about 1,800 pounds. But again, as we move from NCHRP 350 to MASH, the weights of both of those vehicles increased <coughs> by 600 pounds. Uh, not only that, but uh, some of the test conditions changed. Uh, off to the left here, you see test conditions 32 and 33. Those used to be at a 15 degree angle where the vehicle would uh, readily gate through if it were to hit it on the nose at an angle but that angle has been reduced uh, for the terminals. That's, uh, that's a significant change. The beginning length of need test uh, used to be with a lighter truck at only 20 degrees, at additional five degrees and additional 600 pounds. We're needing to load that anchorage quite a bit more, so we needed to account for that. We need to make some design changes to be able to accommodate that type of load capacity. And, um, the other thing is as we move from MASH 2009 to MASH 2016, uh, the reverse direction vehicle changed. Well, it turns out that we tested uh, both with the pickup truck and the small car. But uh, technically, you only need to test with the small car for the MASH uh, 16 compliance. <clears throat> so, so what happens on an end-on hit? Well, you, you have an errant vehicle impacting the end of the terminal, and there's going to be five things that are going to happen pretty much instantaneously. So you have about 170 pounds of weight just hanging on the end of the rail, and at the point of impact, the vehicle is going to accelerate the mass of that head to the same speed as the vehicle. So at a design type impact, you're going to take 170 pounds and send it sliding down the rail at 60 miles an hour. Uh, because there is a connection of the head to the post, you need to uh, release the connection of the head from the post. You will uh, fracture post number one very quickly. You'll begin to deform the W beam rail. You'll need to begin that kinking process. And then uh, the anchor bracket needs to be released. And those five things are going to happen literally in just a few milliseconds. So uh, a terminal needs to render the end of the barrier safe when it's impacted end on, and it also needs to provide anchorage when it's impacted at or downstream of that beginning length of need point. So we said that was at the third post. So any impact at post number three and beyond, the terminal needs to act like guardrail. 
and that is that beginning length need point, uh, the third post, about 12 and a half feet downstream uh, from post number one, where the terminal needs to provide anchorage. So let me show you what that looks like uh, on an impact condition. Here you see 5,000 pounds at 25 degrees impacting at the third post. Well, the vehicle is now being captured, contained, redirected, but the end anchor itself, the cable, is being loaded and your terminal is providing the resistance to be an anchor. So on a traffic face hit, a terminal needs to provide anchorage and needs to be able to accommodate that beginning length of need point, which in the MSKT is at the third post. Terminal also needs to render the end of the barrier safe when impacted end on. And what you see here is uh, 5,000 pounds at uh, 100 kilometers an hour which converts to about 62 miles an hour, uh, impacting the system uh, zero degrees. And we've uh, traveled about 50 feet, and we brought that pickup truck uh, to a stop in about a second and a half. Vehicle is safely decelerated. So you see numbers clicking away there. This is a high-speed film at 1,000 frames per second. So every number that clicks by is a millisecond. So what you see here is 1,500 frames in a second and a half. And that's what it took to bring that 5,000-pound vehicle to a stop, hitting the end of it at 62 miles an hour. And all things considered, not a lot of damage uh, when you consider the severity of the impact. And, and what that tells us is the energy of the impact was absorbed by the kinking of the rail and not so much the deformation of the vehicle, meaning the occupants uh, inside would be uh, experiencing a, a relatively uh, mild ride down. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that that's a, a, a joy ride, a ride you'd want to go to at an amusement park, but uh, should you hit one of these things end on, they are designed to keep the forces relatively low. And this is what it looked like after impact with the uh, impact head uh, down about uh, at the 50 foot point. The system has been out uh, for uh, over a year and uh, we have uh, actually uh, uh, two years. Uh, we received our FHWA letter two years ago. Uh, so there's many, many thousands of these across the country. Uh, TxDOT has just recently added it to their standards, but there are some states that have been using it for quite some time. So we have been able to gather uh, some information on how it's uh, performing out in the field, and uh, thus far we're very pleased with what we've seen. On an impact like you see right here, you can tell that the vehicle hit this at a very shallow angle because the impact head is still in line with the rail. Where this one right here, even though we put a lot of rail through the impact head, the forces were uh, somewhat at an angle because the vehicle was somewhat at an angle, causing that impact head at some point to rotate. So you'll see that impact head in a lot of different configurations after an impact, but if it's sitting straight on the rail like you see here, you know that the impact was a very shallow angle, uh, pretty much end on. So when it comes time to repair these systems, uh, we would uh, recommend that you keep the downstream end of the rail uh, attached to the post. You would cut the rail off at the exit slot. And because of that open throat, uh, there's uh, not gonna be uh, too much difficulty if you see a head looking just like this, not too much difficulty to get the head off. But if, uh, if there does get um, locked up somewhere downstream, you can always just attach a chain to it and pull it off like you see there. <clears throat> I mentioned retrofits. I'm gonna to touch on this briefly. Uh, TxDOT does have a standard uh, to retrofit existing 31 inch NCHRP 350 terminals and convert them to MASH systems. I said before, and I'm gonna emphasize again, by simply putting an MSKT impact head on an NCHRP 350 system, that does not convert it to a MASH system. 
It's still a compliant NCHRP 350 system, but there is a retrofit program in place, and it's very important that the program has already been established, but it's important that it's overseen and managed, and the people that are doing the work are well-educated on what needs to happen to properly retrofit. We do have a, a pre-inspection checklist for uh, retrofit applications. Uh, TxDOT does have a standard for both steel post retrofit and for wood post retrofit. Uh, TxDOT did a really good job putting these standards together. To the best of my knowledge, these are the uh, first standard sheets that uh, the industry has seen uh, for the conversion of an NCHRP 350 system to MASH. But what the standard sheet shows is uh, the components uh, that would be uh, utilized, kept in place, and there's a separate bill of materials for the components that would need to be supplied new uh, and swapped out for the existing 350 system to convert it to MASH. So this is your SGT uh, 13S 31-18. This is your steel post retrofit. And again, this is taking an existing in place 31 inch SKT and converting it to a MASH system. And there's another standard sheet SGT 14W 31-18 and this is the conversion of an existing in place 31 inch NCHRP 350 wood post system that is converted to a MASH wood post system. So everything that you see in that rectangle to the top left would remain in place. Of course, it would have to first be inspected, remain in place, and everything in the bill of materials would be what would need to be supplied as new to make the conversion. Uh, we do have a manual. This would be the uh, first page of our retrofit manual for the wood post uh, retrofit. Uh, as we said uh, earlier, you take Everything from post number three, if this is an NCHRP 350 system, which it is, I can tell uh, it has the old head, so you would keep everything in place as long as it's in decent condition from post three and beyond, and then everything up the front would be converted into a steel post anchorage. So even though it's a wood post mash SKT, it would have a steel post anchorage. So everything that's used in the MSKT that we talked about up to now is the same anchorage that would be used in a wood post system, but post three and beyond would be kept in place. And then I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how to and making sure that we identify all the right parts, uh, making sure that we uh, get the installation correct. Um, I found it to be effective if we can uh, also show the other side of things and use examples of uh, things that were not done right, and we'll call that the how not to section. So taking a look at uh, some installations, uh, many of these are NCHRP 350 systems, <clears throat> but I think you can easily tell here, this would be your text dot uh, wood post system, this would be a type three. Uh, very clearly you can see there's eight foundation tubes, but you should never see that kind of uh, uh, amount of the tube uh, extending above the soil. This would have no chance for a performance on a redirective hit because I've uh, lost all of my embedment, my anchorage, and uh, on an end-on hit, there's a pretty good chance you'd tear out your oil pan or your gas tank if you would ever run over that. So this, this is a hazard uh, waiting to happen. Uh, this is a steel post uh, SKT system, but again, uh, there's no grading applied and just a very poor application. This is a roadside terminal that is intended to be hit from one side, but it's put in the median. So uh, we have the entire back side of the terminal exposed to traffic. We should never have a roadside terminal in the median like this. Uh, and in addition, the rail height is so low uh, we can see post number two sticking up above the rail. Uh, I don't know exactly what that is, but uh, probably uh, uh, 10 inches or more. So we have a system that's far too low and it's uh, installed at a location uh, where it was not designed to be impacted. This is probably one of the worst installations I've ever seen. This is a terminal that's attached to nothing. There's nothing on the downstream end to anchor it. Uh, you can see the pole, the wall on the right, the, the, the big curb, 
this is not a place to put a terminal. This is a place uh, to redesign the hazard, uh, possibly shield it with some type of a crash cushion, but a terminal does nothing here uh, except contribute to the problem. Uh, just a terrible application. Um, of course, here you would have to get through the uh, fire hydrant. I'm not aware of any breakaway fire hydrants, but uh, uh, just a bad location for a terminal here. Uh, this is a uh, location that the impact head would travel down the rail and the system would work just fine for maybe about eight feet. And then you would encounter a pole uh, that could uh, cause some problems. Now, if you look closely, that pole that may be a frangible base, that may be a crash-worthy breakaway pole, uh, even if it is, the pole was not designed to work in conjunction with a terminal, and the terminal was not designed to work in conjunction with a breakaway pole. So even though we may have two crash-worthy devices, uh, together they present a hazard. We never want to see the end of the rail uh, peeking out from the uh, throat area. If this system were to be impacted end on, you could see that impact head slide down the rail and the blunt end of that rail would come in through the uh, engine compartment, possibly through the firewall, and a lot of bad things can happen. Now, if this one were to be hit perfectly centered head on, we might be okay, but again, you never wanna see any open air. This head should be jammed in through the throat uh, where the rail would be interacting with the head. You never want to see that open air. Uh, the terminal can attach to curved rail, but we can't have any curved rail within the terminal. Uh, you're depending on the straight uh, column strength, the resistance of the beam, the stiffness of the beam to allow a track for the impact head to slide down. And when you put curved rail in it like that, you're uh, inducing uh, the potential for buckling, so we never want to have curved rail in the terminal. Now, this is one that's particularly scary because uh, unless you uh, get out of the vehicle and look at it closely, you may not see that there's no bearing plate. So with no bearing plate, I've lost all my anchorage, all my resistance for a terminal to provide an anchor, and the rail is bolted to post number one. So this system uh, probably would not work on an end-on hit or a traffic face hit. An inspection driving by at uh, 60 miles an hour, you'd, you'd never see these things. Here's another thing we need to avoid, uh, burying the bearing plate uh, in, uh, now this looks like it's just in earth, so uh, we might be okay here, uh, but uh, we, we want to avoid situations like this, especially if there's going to be asphalt or concrete in the area, if you lock that bearing plate in place, remember those five things that have to happen on a terminal, you have to uh, fracture post number one. And when you fracture post number one, you release the tension on the cable, which allows the impact head to translate down and kick the cable anchor bracket out. But if that bearing plate is locked in place at the base of post number one, you have a situation where it's going to lock up and the impact head can't get past the cable anchor bracket. So avoid situations like that. <clears throat> One rail would allow the head to translate down. The other rail is going to go right into your engine compartment. Bad situation. Uh, sometimes you look at some of these pictures and you ask yourself, what were you thinking? Uh, this is one of those. We, uh, we don't want to have a, a pole, breakaway or not, sitting directly in front of the terminal. On a traffic face hit, we might be okay on this one. Uh, on an end-on hit, uh, there's not too much that can go right. So the big, big problem with an application like this. <clears throat> way, way too busy, too much going on in, in, the, in the front of the terminal. Remember we showed you those uh, grading details, you should have uh, grading uh, around the terminal. If somehow you were able to activate this system and get that impact head to travel down the rail, uh, we have this handrail up at the top that's probably going to go right through your windshield. So somebody just not understanding the way that these things are intended uh, to function. Uh, some creative maintenance. Uh, they took a wood post foundation tube and uh, jacked it out of the ground a little bit. Uh, I guess that's one of these where you look at it and you say, if it can go wrong, it will. Uh, but uh, clearly somebody not uh, understanding the, 
the intent of the components. We see a lot of these uh, with the wood post system and the impact head that should be connected to the post right here. Those lag screws have come out. And uh, what we've seen is uh, a lot of contractors will put those lag screws in uh, with a hammer. They think it's a lag nail. You know, it's a lag screw. You need to drill a pilot hole and you need to crank that bolt all the way in. Uh, when you try to pound it in with a hammer, you're asking two screws with no interaction of the wood to try to hold up 170 pounds and uh, you can see why it, it, it falls off. Uh, again, if it can happen, it will. Uh, special delivery, I don't know, but uh, we, we don't want to have uh, anything like that in the area of the terminal. This is a situation up at the bolt connection of post number two that I mentioned earlier. We, we never want to see a long bolt uh, attaching to the back side. This is the wrong bolt. We should have the little short bolt connecting right here. <clears throat> and then, of course, I don't know what happened to the bearing plate. Uh, but uh, this is a terminal that needs some attention. And then finally, uh, if it can happen, it will. Uh, somebody installed uh, the timber post upside down that puts the bearing plate halfway up the post. So uh, uh, again, uh, that's, uh, that's it for the, for the MSKT. I, I hope you found the information useful. Um, the installation manuals available, our online training uh, is available. We're here to answer questions for you. And uh, with that, uh, Eric, I'm going to turn it back over to you and ask if we have any questions and, and encourage those that are listening. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat box and uh, we'll try to get through them.